the um, uh, Abhidhamma teachings, uh, there are different ways of classifying consciousness, and one of the fundamental divisions is into four levels or planes of, of consciousness. The ordinary uh, level, the lowest level, which is the ordinary default mode for human beings, is um, sense, desire, consciousness, kama vichara or kama bhumi. This plane or level is where uh, we ordinarily dwell together with animals and devas and other beings is a vast range of beings that classify a sense desire level and being on this level we relate to the our experience mostly through the physical senses and uh, most of our thoughts and emotions revolve around the physical senses and this is just our ordinary way of being it's the most complex level uh, it's the most um, uh, variegated and to such a degree that it's inherently confusing and bewildering. We get lost in, in this level easily. Uh, then there's a level higher, which is called the Rupa Bhumi, a plane or level of form. And it's called that to distinguish it from the third level, the formless. The level of form is when the mind transcends the, the senses, the ordinary senses. And uh, sense desire no longer occurs. The input from the senses uh, is very much minimized and higher levels completely removed. And uh, this is experienced by human beings in deep states of meditation called jhana. When uh, samadhi is taken to such a point that the mind is completely still. And the um, uh, hindrances are, tr are suppressed. They're no longer evident. <clears throat> So sense desire doesn't arise, ill will doesn't arise, anxiety, dullness, and uncertainty no longer arise. So these five in the, in the realm of form. And the third level is what we were attempting to uh, at least get a glimpse of with the meditation is the formless that has no reference whatsoever to to the level of matter, form, body, <coughs> materiality. This is mind only. No. <coughs> so it's called formless arupa. And these three sense, desire, form, and formless are all conditioned, they're all part of um, samsara. And the, the fourth is outside these, is nibbana, or the unconditioned, asankata, which has no characteristic in common with any anything within the conditioned realm. Now these uh, so there's very little that really can be spoken of that, but of these first three, um, they exist both as states of mind that we can access here and now, and also as states of existence, that there are beings born into these different realms. The sense-desire realm, as I said, is the is the widest, is the most compli complex and variegated. So it includes hell beings, ghosts, humans, and the devas, or gods of the sensual planes. So there's a, quite a wide range of existence from uh, 
uh, extreme suffering to great pleasure. Uh, it's all included within this, this level. The realm of form, if beings born into the realm of form are the Brahma beings, and uh, understanding something about the Brahma beings can give us some clues into the nature of, of jhana because their default or ordinary mode of consciousness is the same as the mind of a human being in jhana so these beings have no have only the functional senses of sight and hearing uh, they're not interested in in uh, pleasures of the senses at all they don't eat in ordinary way we do they feed on bliss and um, they don't have sexuality because they have no gender there are no male and female there they are all just reckoned as being so uh, so they don't have sense pleasures of any kind but they're very blissful and and um, joyous and there are four levels of these corresponding to the four levels of jhana. In the first level there's still thought formation. In the second level is dominated by the quality of, of rapture, third by bliss, and the fourth by equanimity. So they become successively more refined states of, of mind and these correspond to the states of mind that we as human beings can access here and now in deep meditation in jhana but all these beings still have bodies they still have form the third level is the realm of the formless and it's very difficult for us to imagine a being existing in formless condition with no physical structure, no body whatsoever. They're just pure mind. So, uh, for example, uh, we can't locate them anywhere. We can't say they're here or there because location is a product of space, which is a product of form. So, when we're talking about mind, and this is contemplating this level of existence can give us some insight into the nature of mind because our mind is the mind is just mind our mind is has an essence this is in essence the same but uh, our experience is that we're tied up with the body as well but mind exists in this realm without a body without any reference to body it's just pure mind yeah. <clears throat> And there are four levels of these beings. The first is boundless space, which still has some very tenuous connection to the physical world and the reference to space. But after that, there's no reference whatsoever. There's boundless consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. That last is a very subtle and tricky level to be with any kind of understanding of. The name is um, explained in one place as uh, you can't say it's it's perception because it's not percept there's nothing perceived in the ordinary sense, but you can't call it non-perception because it's not like a blank annihilation. And it, uh, it gives a, a metaphor, a kind of homely metaphor that um, a monk and a novice are out on alms round and the novice sees they're coming up to a, a puddle of water and he warns the, the monk, he says, Venerable Sir, there is water. And the monk says, Oh, there's water, good. Uh, uh, fill my water jug for me, will you? And he says, Venerable Sir, there is no water. Because there's, there's, it's neither water nor non-water. There's enough, there's enough water to get your feet wet so you've got to avoid it, but it's not enough to fill your water jugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's uh, 
neither perception nor non-perception. So to recap, you know, if you want to take this with you and if you want to experiment with this meditation on your own, the idea is you start with ordinary perception. This is called contemplation of village. You just do your ordinary mundane surroundings and just try and be aware in a non-judgmental, completely open way of the ordinary environment and go beyond what you can actually see and take in, you know, just with your mental imagination taking the surrounding area and then you abstract layers from that you know, by practicing a selective non-attention so next stage you cease to pay attention to man-made objects so now you're only aware of nature and this is contemplation of forest so you remove your attention from houses and cars and buildings and telephone poles and pay attention only to the ground and the plants and the trees and the birds and whatnot. And then that's called contemplation of forest. Then you remove your attention from that and you pay attention only to the underlying earth. This is contemplation of earth. And you uh, begin with your surrounding area, be aware of the ground and the rocks, the hills, valleys natural geography of the area without any attention to any living things and allow your mind to expand until you're taking in the whole of the earth the whole globe the whole planet and then that's a mass of earth element taking up a region of space and you cease to pay attention to the earth element and there remains left behind a region of space just let the boundary naturally fade and be aware of boundless space. So now your consciousness is filling boundless space. Then you withdraw your attention from conscious from space and be aware only of the consciousness. Then you withdraw your attention from consciousness and be aware of nothingness. And then try and try as to remove your attention even from nothingness and see what's even even less than nothing. Okay, so that's uh, a brief introduction to the idea and the practice of formless realms, formless abiding. And I'll, I'll be happy to take a few questions if there are any. Yes. I think you clarif uh, you talked about this, but I didn't quite follow. Um, what's the relationship between um, these stages or areas of contemplation yes. and jot like stages of jhana? Yes, uh, there are most m most often um, if you read the suttas, they'll talk about four jhanas. There's the four jhanas. Mm -hmm. Those are the jhanas of form. But then there's also four jhanas of the formless. Mm -hmm. So there's, by that count, there's eight altogether. So there's, they, these are like um, uh, another class of jhana. Okay. Thank you. So Ajahn, um, in terms of developing this as a meditation practice, um, mm -hmm. so going through all of these in the space of 20 or 30 minutes felt extremely compressed yes mm -hmm. yeah so yeah how like it's how would you recommend developing it as an actual practice um i would say initially to begin with to spend as much time as you need to get through those first few stages up to boundless space hmm. and even just stop there until you get feel like you've got some some proficiency with it mm -hmm. and then uh, in subsequent subsequently you can shorten the time you spend on the first three stages and get the critical one is to get to boundless space mm -hmm. and then from boundless space you know just hold that as long as long as you want and then 
uh, withdraw your attention from space and rest in boundless consciousness. Mm. I think once you get a certain degree of proficiency, you can go through the first three form stages relatively quickly and yeah. then spend your time exploring those the, the formless stages. Yeah. yeah, I found the first the first two were quite easy. Yeah. But then going to um, earth element itself yeah. and a bit more difficult. And yeah. then going from that to space substantially more difficult. Yeah. And then each progressive one. Um, so do you recommend then being completely <coughs> undistracted and unwavering in each stage before trying to move to the next one? Um, that would, yeah, that would be ideal. Okay. You know, get whatever, but I also would not, would not wait for perfection because you know, the, you know, one, <laughs> you want to use this as an exploration. But try and get as much stability as you can, and you know, then maybe the next time you do it, you, you, you'll be better and get more, <laughs> more stability. Because just my first feeling is that this is something I would do over the course of a whole day, like over several hours. Yeah. I would go through these stages yeah. over the course of several hours. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. There was one. I get some some funny reactions with this sometimes. There was one fellow who had a career in geology. <laughs> <laughs> he said he actually found that the, the earth stage was more complex than, uh. the, than the contemplation of forest. I don't know, that's just trees and bushes, but now we're getting into granite and sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, for what reason do you commune with the formed and formless entities? I don't. Mm. You no, know, there's no no reason to commune with them. Mm. That's not that's not the point. The point is to experience that state of mind yourself. Uh, it it's not even possible to commune with the formless. They have no no point of contact or reference to the levels lower than them. So they have no interest and no even ability to to access in, in anything lower than them and and the. The beings in the form realm, it's only the lowest level that, that still have thought formation that take any interest whatsoever in the lower realms. There are stories in the suttas of them, like Brahma Sahampati came down and asked the Buddha to teach. Um, so they, on rare occasions, can take interest in, in the realms lower than them. But they're still conditioned, and they're still, those beings are not perfect, and they are not. Uh, they're not in, uh, necessarily enlightened. They have the, they don't have sense uh, defilements, but they still have defilements of uh, wrong view and pride. So, if you're saying that the higher is not interested in the lower, is the lower interested in the higher? Generally, the lower can't even be aware of the higher. Mm. When the Brahma gods, even to, for the Brahma gods to interface with the Devas, they have to take on a coarser form, or they're invisible to the Devas. So Ajahn, coming back to the, the development of the formless meditations, how, how do you relate this to the quest for enlightenment? Like, How does this fit into the overall Buddhist framework of practice? Yeah, uh, well, let's see. It's first of all important to recognize it's not even mastery of the, of the formless jhanas is not enlightenment. That's not liberation. It's still within the conditioned realm. But it simplifies and purifies the mind. And it's like the, 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 the higher you can go in the jhanas, it's like you're stripping away whole layers of samsaric confusion and complication. Um, it, it's actually not possible to realize nibbana while you're in a jhana, but the optimum time when the mind is most fluid for doing that is immediately after. Hmm. After sitting in jhana and then emerging from jhana, then the mind is at its 
peak possibility for <coughs> doing that focused examination of, of conditioned phenomena that can allow you to break through. I'm curious about something you said in the beginning um, related to transcending the senses. Yes. Um, and I'm so kind of similarly to this last question, I'm curious about, um, well, I'm thinking about how often we are taught to tune into our senses yes. um, in order to access the present moment and, yes. and therefore cultivate peace. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about transcending the senses. Yeah. Um, well, tuning into uh, immediate sense impressions, that's, that's a... Um, an aspect of, of uh, vipassana or insight, you know, that's a, uh, that that's the practice that actually then, uh, in the end, leads to liberation. But this is a you know a, a different thing I'm talking about here is transcending the senses, is um, the entrance into jhana, is done by transcending the senses. Uh, and this is another advantage of, of exploring these states of mind is then we understand this level better by stepping outside of it, right? It's like you climb the mountain and look down and you can see the whole valley below. But when you're in the valley, you, you, don't, you, you don't see the whole picture. So it gives you a comparison, like a different state of mind to compare like our, ordinarily we're so caught up in the senses it's hard to imagine not being caught in it. But if you can access a state of mind where the senses are not not pre not dominant and then finally you know, not even present, then and it gives you a better handle when you return to this mode of consciousness. You have a better understanding of it. Do you truly believe that you can liberate without the totality liberating itself? I don't itself? understand the question. Is it possible to liberate as an individual rather than as a as a collective? Oh, 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 oh I see what you mean. Um, is it? Yeah, I believe it is that the mind the mind be, uh, realizes the unconditioned is liberated. Mm. Why would you think you need to take the whole, whole conditioned samsara along with you? Well, it's just more like the bodhi path of knowing that you can liberate, but well, oh, I'm I'm Theravada. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't uh, <laughs> That's time afterwards. <laughs> I don't feel the need to wait around for a <laughs> real ass slacker to take <laughs> Can I give a brief answer to his question, Ajahn? What's that? Can I give a brief answer to his sure, question? Quite. Depends on whether you're looking at it from the perspective of the conditioned or the unconditioned. Hmm. If you look at it from the perspective of conventional reality, then yes, individuals attain awakening. Hmm. If you look at it from the perspective of absolute reality, there are no individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good, yeah. yeah. So, it depends. So the, the Mahayana often looks at things from the perspective of the absolute. So, and they talk in those terms. Um, but if we try to apply the absolute terms to conventional reality, we just get confused. Mm -hmm. So we have to know which is which, and when it's appropriate to apply which one. Mm -hmm. yeah.
<laughs> what um, what are you seeing as maybe the the most detrimental spiritual consciousness trap in your current reality? Uh, probably the the self view, the sense of a the sense of a real uh, abiding self. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Can you expand a little bit on the abiding self? What the self sits well, The sense of a substantial self, even, um, is probably more important than abiding. It's the sense of a, of things existing from their own side, or substantiality in general. It's, it's like um, kind of a mind, a, a mind virus that you know, cor corrupts everything. Mm. And, um, and we're kind of caught with that. That sort of um, the so sort of the or, the the ordinary mind in the world is, is, is takes that as an unexamined assumption that self and other make sense. That um, uh, that there's such a that me and my mind is more than just a conventional phrase. Related to that, I um, I have been noticing uh, fear coming up in moments when I um, when the sense of self uh, is less strong. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, kind of like the attachment to yeah. uh, what is safe and identity. And so yeah. I'm curious how to work with that fear. Uh, well, you have to get past that. Uh, um, you're, be you're, you're being you're uh, being fearful of losing that which you never had. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the end. You know, it's, a, it's a meaningless. Uh, it's a meaningless fear. It's not. Mm. It's not a question of. Um, see, we're not trying to say that destroy yourself we're saying you, you don't have a self anyway just recognize that see that <laughs> you know? it's already the reality it's not something to it, again it's the, the the spiritual path is not you know, making up new things it's just discovering what's real and what's what's more fundamental level of your being and a sense of self is a very superficial level of your being and you you know it's just a conventional thought form and you get past that and you, you, you're, you it's, it's very liberating you're not bound by that sense Thank you. Wow.